some community guests tonight, which I'm very excited about. The first one we're going to speak to needs no introduction. She's Kim Schaefer from the Downtown Project. Hey, and you've fine. got some exciting news to share with us. You've created an app for the Downtown Project, right? We really have a, this really cool new app that one of the greatest problems, and I'm sure everybody in this room and people who are watching will agree, one of the biggest challenges of a, an accelerating community is how do you keep track of what's going on? Very true. And so it's been something we've struggled with from the very, very beginning. And uh, this app is sort of a solution, we hope, to at least part of that problem. So it's a centralized place where people can go right on their smartphone. They can know what's happening downtown in the next few days. Uh, event organizers can go right on there and add their, their events themselves. We do a little moderation just to make sure that our, <laughs> our audience doesn't get any spam. And then it, it becomes this really simple tool to know what's happening in, in the neighborhood. This is awesome and it, it has kind of been almost like an evolution of downtown, the, you know, the community because when we first started there was one thing on per night and now there's about six things on each night and you sort of like, you get so upset when you miss out on something. You'll see photos on Facebook, you'll be like, why didn't I know about that? So I'm guessing that this app really solves that problem. I think it will help. I don't think it will keep you from missing things because you just can't, unless you're lucky, you don't have clones. You can't be in two places at once. Very true. But it is really, a, I think, a, a milestone for us as a neighborhood. As Absolutely. A because we've gone from this time when I knew everything that was going on and I could be everywhere <laughs> all the time. And now suddenly there are a million things happening and so many people who are really, really engaged and really passionate and creating these incredible reasons for people to gather and to collide and learn with one another. And so we are hopeful that this will be a vehicle for people to find those opportunities. That's awesome. And I imagine it will be really useful for people who come in out of town and they're doing trying to mingle with the community and all they need to do is get an app and they can just start going to things, right? Absolutely. It's, it's it's our plan to use that just in, when we have so many guests that come and visit uh, Downtown Project to just include a link to the app in their itinerary when we send it to them uh, in their email and that way they know when they get here and they can they don't have to depend on people who are inviting them out they can learn about what's happening sort of in an organic and really natural way and experience the neighborhood on their own. That's perfect. Now I'm sure a lot of work went into it so we want as many people to download it as possible. So it's on the iTunes store right for it's iOS right now? Down there. Mm -hmm. store now. We, it's just for Apple right now. We worked with a great Vegas tech company, Raster Media. You can see Let's George at the front. <laughs> The app is on the iTunes store now, and we're talking about the next iteration, which would be Android or something that would work for all smartphones. But you got to start somewhere. Right? Absolutely, and the iPhone is a great platform to start with. Well, thank you so much, it's and my like, pleasure. I hope that me. everybody in the audience takes the chance. Actually, I can see a lot of people right now; <laughs> they're going to be downloading it very soon. So, um, excellent work in another chapter in the downtown tech and the downtown project scene. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, before we end uh, your particular chat, I'm going to get you to have the honor of picking the fortune cookie of the week. I'm going to dig down. You're going to dig right down? Because right. that's what I like. I like to get down to the heart and soul of what's going on. This is going to be a good one, I can tell. Can we get our fortune cookie handler, Alan, out, please? Oh my gosh, you have to be in life Yes. <laughs> Things have changed since last time you came very on. Very special. <laughs> thank you very much, Alan. It's my pleasure. And thank, thank you, you, Kim. So next we have Andrew Bogeri, and he's from Full Spectrum Laser. And uh, we've had you on the show before. We use your laser cutter in our hackerspace, which is awesome. Um, but you're going to be talking about a really cool event that is definitely fulfilling a need in the Vegas tech community and it's called Slash Boot Slash Hardware, right? Which I love the name, by the way. So tell me about what it's, what's involved in this. I'm, I'm really glad that you like the name. I, awesome. I, thought, I thought hard about it. Um, <laughs> so this is sort of the thing that I do in my free time. I started a meetup group dedicated to helping people that are interested in starting hardware companies. And so, you know, I've recently there's been this really big renaissance and kind of people building connected hardware, you know, Arduino's out mm -hmm. there, Raspberry Pi, all these platforms that make it easy. It's a great time now to get into it, huh? Yeah, and but there's still so many challenges. And, right. You know, software you can learn because there's all this information and people are putting their brains online in a sense, but that's not true for hardware as of yet. Um, so the hope with the Meetup Group and with this conference is to bring in speakers and really just connect the community. So the expert speaker that comes in once a month or the speakers at this conference that I'm putting on are kind of the uh, 
the light that's drawing everybody in so they can meet with each other and learn a little bit at the same time. That's awesome. I think hearing okay. how people got into hardware to begin with will really help people get there because a lot of the time it'll be someone had no idea what they were doing. They probably tried to blow themselves up several times while <laughs> trying to figure it out. And I guess hearing those origin stories is going to hopefully help people sort of like take down that fear of playing with something real rather than playing with something on the software side, right? Yeah, exactly. It's it's, it's not necessarily harder from an engineering perspective, but it's certainly more intimidating, and it really shouldn't be. And there's no. so much going on here that makes Vegas an ideal place to start a hardware company. Definitely. And um, so what kind of things are you going to have on for your, for your conference? So quite a few things. Um, one thing that I'm really trying to push with the conference and the meetup is that this isn't just connected gadgets or wearables. It doesn't need to have software. Um, I had a really great meeting with Stitch Factory, finally. Awesome. I met with Rachel, so I want to you know, loop in the fashion community, loop in the people that are doing consumer electronics, even kind of the more traditional heavy manufacturing industries. So you know, a few things that we're going to cover, um, how to work with US manufacturers, mm -hmm. how to raise capital, you know, hacking PR and Kickstarter. Kickstarter is such a huge thing these days. So that's, you know, those are just a few of That's about really cool topics. because you, you, you kind of need that end to end <laughs> attitude. It's just like, okay, so I made this weird new contraption. Like, how do I get it out there? Um, as well as the fact that you touched on the trend of wearable tech, which is becoming huge. And again, it's providing people with more of an incentive to look into hardware. So it's great that you got Stitch Factory involved. I'm expecting to see some light up dresses or maybe some kind of weird, like, Necro Mimi style, yeah. like, <laughs> ears or something like that. So I'm excited to see how this goes. So, how often do you? have your meetup? So we meet once a month, um, usually at Work in Progress. They've been mm -hmm. super supportive. Um, I've nice. done a meetup at Sin Shop, and you know Craig Adkins, is, he's beaten me up to do one down at uh, his new 3D printing awesome. space. Too. He's very into this kind of thing, too, so that's great that he's reached out to you. Yeah, no, Craig's one of my speakers. We're, we're really close. I think he's going to probably blow all our minds with <laughs> the depth of knowledge that he brings from you know doing logistics for Amazon. Right, exactly. And uh, your, your event, too, what are the dates for that, and how do people kind of get in touch? Because it's not quite sort of solidified, but if people want more information, how can they get in touch with you on that? Yeah, that's... Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> the website is boot, um, well, http colon slash slash boot.lbhardware.com. Mm -hmm. uh, May 31st and June 1st, it's going to run from about 9 in the morning till 7 at night. Nice. 12 speakers, two days. It's going to be in downtown Vegas. I'm talking with a few different venues, so we'll settle on that. Hopefully in the next couple weeks. Um, you can check out the website. There's a link there to just register your interest, share your email. If you want to share some other info, that's great too, but otherwise, once I get um, you know ticketing worked out, we're going mm -hmm. with Ticket Cake. So once that's all set up, everyone will get an email to go and purchase their tickets, and then they'll come in and get the chance to meet with each other and learn from each other, and especially the speakers. Excellent. I can't wait to see what people put together. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, me too. Um, thank you so much. And um, I'm, I'm hoping to, to find out more details. I've definitely signed up, so I'm, I'm yes. awaiting more news in the <laughs> inbox. Thank you so much. Yeah. And before we end this segment, I wanted to just call something out. Um, it happened a couple of nights ago. Um, and it was kind of an honor, and we didn't see it coming, and we were very surprised. Um, the Tech Nevada Honors uh, event run by T-Ban was on recently, and we actually, um, the downtown podcast that is, won the Vegas Technology Spirit Award for 2013. So, yeah. <laughs> So here it is in all its glory here. We're still a little shell-shocked about that. Um, but we, we just wanted to thank um, everybody who comes to the podcast, who views our podcast. Um, thank you to our wonderful volunteers, Denise and Alan and Pavel and Dylan, who can't be here tonight, unfortunately. But we'll definitely catch up with him next week about it. And of course, Jackie, who's manning the camera right now. Um, thank you very much to her, too, for being able to hustle all our guests every week. So, And for anyone else that I miss, Spadoni and Sean and everybody who helped make this a, a reality, thank you so much. Um, and that's all for this segment. Thank you. We have an awesome crowd today. So unfortunately, Dylan is out of town this week, so he has handed the reins to me to do the main interview tonight.
right, so go easy on me, it's my first time. Um, but it, it is a great pleasure to be able to interview our guest tonight. Um, he, again, he needs no introduction. Uh, he is the, the, the man behind such um, establishments as the Downtown Cocktail Room, Oscars, um, Emergency Arts, the Beat Coffee House, and several restaurants that start in the Container Park. Um, he's also responsible for helping open the Inspire Theatre, so I'm sure that everyone in the audience has been to at least one, two, or three of those events, uh, sorry, establishments or more. And so it is a great honor for me to introduce the man who was also refused a ride from a taxi driver because of the way he looked one time. I'm sure I'll follow up with him on that. Please uh, put your hands together for Michael Conthery. a really particular article that said that you tried to get a taxi ride downtown one time and you were refused the ride. Can you give us a little more information? Sure, sure. Uh, that, that did happen and in fact it's happened more than one time. So yeah, that particular time, uh, I know the laws about taxis and about picking up people and, and so he said, uh, I've, I've learned since this by the way, but uh, he said, people that look like you, they don't pay me. And I said, uh, oh, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not getting out of the taxi, so we're going to have to call the police. And he begged me, please get out. Please get out. Finally, after about 15 minutes, he took me home. And I tipped him. And he was very, very happy. So, yeah, yeah. That. That so nice. I mean, I wouldn't pick me up either. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so. I don't right. know, you're very humble. I would have started name dropping and going like, if you're, no. you're never going to go there again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I admire that. I admire that a lot. Yeah. And you said it's happened to you several times. It has. It has. <laughs> the, the key is, if you live anywhere close by, just tell them you're going to the win. And as soon as they start to drive, you say, you know what, I changed my mind. How about over here? Yeah, <laughs> that works. Uh -huh. That's great. I'll remember that as a tip if I, if I uh, ever get Okay, so on to the real questions. You've been in Vegas for over 18 years, so you know, that's, that's enough that's true. to be a veteran. You opened the downtown cocktail rooms, you know, I think over seven years ago, and you also, you know, followed by the Emergency Arts in 2010. So what was your original vision? Because you were kind of in the downtown scene first, and you wanted to create something for the locals. So what did you originally feel back then when you were opening these establishments for local Las Vegas? Uh, it, it's such a long story. It actually goes back to when I first moved here, and I've told this story so many times. Um, I realized the first month I was here that there was no downtown. I was just looking for somewhere that felt normal, that wasn't on the strip, that wasn't in a strip mall, and, and just by process of elimination. I was living on the west side because I thought that's where I was supposed to live. And uh, I came down, I discovered this area, and the people said not to go to, that it was too dangerous. And, and I, just, I just would walk the streets, literally, and just daydream about the possibilities. And that got me so excited that um, by the time 1999 rolled around, I figured out a way to move an office space over here. I had a, a cleaning business, a commercial cleaning business with a friend of mine. And I started to meet one person after another. Um, my landlord at the time connected me with uh, this, this gentleman named Doug at the Office of Business Development. And we just started exchanging ideas. And it, it's hard for some people to believe, but way back then it was impossible to have a bar hopping night out. So at that time, there was a, a minimum separation distance requirement of 1,500 feet between any two taverns. So effectively, you couldn't bar hop ever. Wow. So, um, so that was the first priority, was creating a business improvement district and changing the zoning in this particular neighborhood, which was six blocks. And then stimulating some form of, of entertainment. And so that's what eventually became the, in 2002, the Fremont East Entertainment District. That's incredible mm -hmm. that you had to do everything from changing zones. It just, it yeah. seems like there were so many things that became the reason why downtown just wasn't like a mecca or there just wasn't anywhere mm -hmm. for locals to hang out. And like, I'm sure that would have been extremely difficult to do that sure. by yourself, you know, considering that 
that the downtown project wasn't kind of formed and Tony Shea wasn't there and mm -hmm. like you know speaking of that you had downtown cocktail room you had emergency arts and people moving into there like when Tony Shea kind of came and said almost like discovered downtown and the possibilities of it all like were you sort of sitting there going oh get off my lawn I've already kind of started <laughs> this or like like how did you feel no uh it was it was actually more like pitch a tent on my lawn and can I get you anything to drink you know it was uh we, we had met back in 2007 through a mutual friend. I'm sure many of you know Sarah Nisperos. And, uh, and we had interactions over the, the couple of years after that. And he would come down and visit. And it was in 2009 that Sarah called me and said, hey, you remember Tony? And I said, yeah. And she said, well, I think you guys should sit down and talk. And uh, he has some ideas. and. And I, I think you need to, to talk to each other. And Tony texted me a few minutes later, and we sat down a half hour later, and we talked for hours. And, and, uh, and I remember going home that night and just thinking how excited I was that hopefully someday this guy will get involved. And, and at that time, I just thought maybe he'll open a business, maybe he'll buy a building. Maybe he'll just bring some friends down and start hanging out more often, or live down here. So you and so, have no idea what he was eventually going to end up doing. Even no, I mean, through the course of time, we talked about lots of things, but um, the scale just kept growing and growing. And I, I thought this is way too good to be true, <laughs> and and it's all been bigger than I ever imagined. So, it's amazing. It is, mm -hmm. and we've, we've definitely needed stubborn people such as yourself and Tony to just say no, this is going to happen and we're going to make a lot of changes and we're going to go against a lot of kind of th things that we just accepted mm -hmm. in this community as not being possible. And, like, it must right. have been amazing being at the forefront of that. So on that subject, like, was it hard getting support initially when you were trying to almost sell the idea of emergency arts to get artists to move in and, and become a presence there when there really wasn't a lot else around and you couldn't guarantee the foot traffic from the, the entertainment part of the community? Oh, sure. Um... That's, that's an interesting story because at that time, there was, everything was stalling. There were no projects that were under construction. So it, there was downtown cocktail room, and there was the Griffin and Beauty Bar. And it was just the three of us. And, uh, and there was nothing happening during the daytime. So one thing that I had learned through the construction process was that bringing a building up to code was very, very expensive and time consuming. So to me, and my fiance at the time, Jennifer, now my wife, um, the only building that, that had any semblance of being able to be occupiable space immediately was the former Fremont Medical oh. Clinic. So I had a good relationship with El Cortez, and those guys were really good. And we actually gave them a proposal about a month or two before Tony and I sat down. And at that time, we were just like, let's just try everything we can, because we were really hurting. We were considering leaving Las Vegas. And, uh, and it, it sat for a while. And I think it was, uh, actually, we gave it to them in 2008. That's wrong. So it was 2009 at the end where they said, yes, you know, go ahead and try this out. We figured we'd have like an open house. We'd, we'd offer inexpensive artist space. We wouldn't change anything structurally in the building, and we would let everyone do what they wanted inside their own space. And, and my wife, Jen, she was really the one that got the word out to the, the arts community, and we started to get people through. I think within a week or two, we had commitments from about 15 different people. And there were 20 spaces on the first floor, so it started out as just the first floor, and it took about a year to grow into the second floor. And the B was just a byproduct that we thought if we're going to do this, we need to have a hub that generates regular traffic and can be a meeting place and a community space during the daytime. And you have to invite people in to kind of see what, yeah. to see through and, and be able to peruse the other spaces and things like that. So it was a wonderful solution yeah. for that. And it, look, it's still challenging to get people to go through. But right. to us, it was a, a really mutually beneficial relationship to generate traffic which would then result in some interest in the building and then, and then the individual tenants <coughs> doing their events and bringing people into the beat. And so here we are. It's been now oh, you know, almost four years later. 
I think I can speak for everyone when I say that the the big coffee house as well as the whole emergency house building is still the, like the cultural heart of that downtown right. Pimony area. And it's wonderful to see it still flourishing. So yeah. Definitely. I'm glad to hear you say that because it was the least expensive project that I've ever done. <laughs> and, That's how it yeah, should be, right? Yeah. Like, you know, the cool stuff is the cheapest yeah. stuff. Yeah. There's a lot of love in there. Make rather yeah. than the money yeah. For sure. Yeah, and I uh, usually be sweet there too, which mm. is so, so yeah, so after that, you know, you've, you've moved on and opened a lot of other businesses, and I guess they're all different genres. So, you know, you've got your coffee house, and you've got downtown cocktail room, and then you've got restaurants, and then you've sure. got a theater such as Inspire. Like, how do you actually, like, manage so many different genres? Like, what is it like having to put different hats on but for, you know, every sort of business? Like yeah, um, well, first thing is, find a good team. And and now I've been able to expand my team. I think I have seven people on board full time just on my management team. This is the future of Right. And and so the most important thing is just, you know, to find the right people that are committed to making good things happen and work really hard. And we have a long way to go. I mean we're we're nowhere close to where we need to be in the end, and this is one of those businesses that just takes time. And it, it may take six months, it may take six years to actually, you know, find the stride where, you know, we're profitable and we're really proud of the product that we're, um, you know, we're creating and, and the energy. And, and that takes a lot of time and effort. And, you know, I, I love the diversity because it's what keeps me engaged and keeps me, me really interested is, you know, I don't want to do the same thing and then duplicate it a hundred times. It's, it's a challenge, and I actually want downtown Las Vegas to be this place where people go home and say, I saw something in Vegas that was as good or better than what we have here in LA or in New York or in Portland or Seattle. So I think you have to keep challenging yourself and keep trying to elevate downtown Las Vegas to a point where it's on par with the rest of the US cities. Very, very much agree with that. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so, what are your thoughts on you know the cultural needs that you still don't think are fulfilled downtown? Like, so are there any gaps in in kind of around what you've been doing or what downtown projects? Are doing? Yeah, yeah. I think there there's a lot of entertainment now. There's a lot of food and beverage. Um, it seems like live music is really sort of pushing ahead and, and making progress. To me, I think. Inevitably, it always comes back to the art. And my wife would agree with me here, and we talk about this a lot, is that in most cities, it's really art that either creates an energy or makes it really cool or makes it unique or draws a lot of people. And I think Life is Beautiful was a great example of that. I think the live music was amazing. I think culinary was amazing. But I think what really set that festival apart was the art component, which you know, was to anyone that attended almost, I mean, for some, I think it was the most memorable part. And so I think that's where we have a lot of work ahead of us. I would love to see that more. I think the mm -hmm. best thing that came out of Life is Beautiful was the, the art that was left behind. It was almost like a mark of what, of what was. And I come from a town where there's a lot of street art and it's celebrated as mm -hmm. Melbourne in Australia. And when sure. I saw art come popping up, it was like there were tears in my eyes. I honestly thought that that was... Like I think a lot of people had that experience, and, and it's still here. Almost all of it is still here. And then hopefully this year there'll be more, and we'll keep building on that and building on that. But it's, you know, it's just feeling differently when you're walking down the street. You know, I think green space is another gaping hole that we have. You know, we need bigger parks, more parks, just places where people can feel like, um, you know, they're just, it's normal. And right. it's like their their home city. Hopefully, Las Vegas is an adopted home city, and I think that's another step is getting to the point where we're proud to say we're from Las Vegas. It's not well, I live in Las Vegas, but I'm from somewhere else. And that tends to be the yeah. best thing people say. And sure. They don't. They can't just leave it at I live in Las Vegas. Right. You know, they, they feel as though they have to almost excuse that behavior. Yeah. Yeah, and it shouldn't be like that. And locals, or I guess like natives, should be really proud of the fact that they grew up in Las Vegas rather than mm -hmm. saying, but I might be moving to Seattle. Or sure, like sure. I've seen that a lot too, is, is that sometimes people will stop me on the street and they'll say, I'm from Las Vegas. I was born and raised here. I needed to escape. I moved to New York. I moved to San Francisco. But because of everything that's happened, 
I'm back, I'm so proud of it, and I want to be a part of it. Like, that's the best stuff. I feel like that's the mark of the mm -hmm. success that we've been heading for, and it's, no it's, doubt. it's definitely encouragement for people to keep going like yourself when, when times get hard and you're juggling so many things. Sure. It's so wonderful feedback for you to get. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, just to finish up, like, why don't you tell us about the latest place you open, which is the Scullery, and it's in this building. Yeah. I walked past before it was open, and it looks so inviting and so warm yeah. and so kind of, um, I guess, homely that I wanted to come in, but it wasn't open. It was a soft <laughs> yeah. opening. <laughs> so why don't you tell, tell us about what that kind of, how that came about? Okay. Well, I, you know, I think it started like some of the other projects that have been started, which is there's a space. What can we do with it? And um, that space, I started working on probably three or four years ago. And then, OK, it's going to be something else for a minute. And then it was, OK, no, let's do something with it. And let's make it the mini Inspire. And it was only 2,000 square feet. So it was an interesting configuration, especially with the structural columns running through the center of right. it. So the yeah, so uh, you know, I, I, I take inspiration from San Francisco and from New York. And just wanted to do something that was light and approachable and fun, especially, I'll be honest, I was targeting the female population with that. Okay. Because you know, we, do all, we do a lot of wine. We do a lot of wine by the glass. We do charcuterie. Um, we do upscale small grocery items, which we're still working on. But the idea is to come in, have a glass of wine, enjoy yourself, have something to eat. And then as you wander through the space, it gets a little bit darker, a little bit more intimate. And then as you get to the back, there's, there's a black box theater space. So for example, tomorrow night, we'll have a jazz band back there. But when you experience the whole thing, it should be reminiscent of something you would find in New Orleans or any other normal city USA. And that's, that's the point. It's yeah. great. It's mm -hmm. like all the little kind of holes, the secrets that people yeah. know about that they can take their friends to. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And it's called the Scullery, right? Scullery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And it's open like right now. Anyone? Yeah. Can come Tuesday in. through Saturday, 5 great. p.m. And it's mm -hmm. a wonderful intimate space from what I've seen. Yeah. Great. Thank well, you. thank you so much for coming to talk to us today. I loved all the really interesting pieces of history. Like sure. I never really understood how it all fit together, so it definitely gave me a great idea. And I hope the audience found that really interesting. I hope so too. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Yeah. Um, can we give him a round? For example, this week is National Bedbug Week. Yes, and many of you might think that bedbugs um, are all about being in the house and in the home and stuff like that, but no, it's when you're traveling. And a lot of you here are actually traveling right now. So it's all about the luggage. You want to keep the luggage wrapped. You want to check the bedding in your hotel. Be aware of the bedbugs. That's the holiday this week. It's also uh, International Whistler's Week. Who here knows how to whistle? Oh, that's good. That's pretty darn good. Who, who's like the loudest? All right, give it. Oh, damn, that hurt my ear. That was good. Oh, okay. oh. Now it's just about showing off. All right. Today is also National Pigs in a Blanket Day. Who loves a pig in a blanket? Yes, yes. Now, do you all know the difference between a UK pig in a blanket versus an Israeli pig in a blanket versus an American pig in a blanket? Anybody? No. All right. No, Pavel, you're just so clever. Um, so we have the uh, UK is uh, a miniature sausage wrapped in bacon. Yes. Uh, in Israel, it's going to be a miniature kosher hot dog wrapped in a ketchup-covered pastry dough like a croissant. Pretty close to America, it's going to be a miniature hot dog, kosher or not, wrapped in a croissant like dough. All right, thank you so much. Those are my holidays. I'm going to move on to these guys here, responsible for your free beer. Yeah. All right, so, so we 
got, we got Chris, we got Keith. Chris is the founder of both Lamps.com and Payroll Shopping. By the way, my new video on YouTube premiered this morning, and Lamps.com was the advertiser on the page. Bam. It's working. It's awesome. It's working. Genius. Yeah. It's working. I can't. I was like, oh my god, I can't even click on it because if I do, I'm banned from YouTube. So I couldn't even click. <laughs> but I, that was really cool. I was excited. And then we have Keith. You're, you're the CEO of Payroll Shopping. That's yes. right, man. So give these guys the sort of um, the download, the, the, the black and white of PayrollShopping.com. Sure. So PayrollShopping.com is a voluntary employee benefit program. And it really is something that's easy to use and administer. And all our members, which are employed by major organizations around the United States, government agencies, healthcare, uh, love our program because it's something that's easy to use. It lets them buy the needs and the wants that they have today, like a refrigerator, a washer, dryer. They get the product today. And then we schedule payments with no interest, no fees. And so it makes it very easy and manageable for them. So we're really combining an employee benefit program with financial wellness. I love it, financial wellness. Speaking of which, uh, April is uh, Financial Literacy Month. It's about being literate in your finances. And this was a holiday that was started to sort of educate Americans who were insufficiently educated in their personal finances and, and, and getting them on a, a better step, a, a, a better track to their financial wellness. So let's just say, for example, I had to buy a new refrigerator. It's a thousand dollars. I don't have the money. Why would I go to you guys and not to Best Buy, for example? That's a great question, Mac. Our program allows individuals to buy the product today, uh, to have an installment contract and payment uh, with no interest, and by structuring it with the employee and the payroll and integrating, we've created a technology which integrates directly with the payroll departments. Um, and so it takes the stress out of the individual's responsibility of missing a payment, having late payments, and we're really leveling the playing field between uh, anybody that has a really high credit score and has a lower credit score. Mm -hmm. It basically eliminates the, uh, the credit card trap that people can get in. Ah. And we're trying to be like a credit card killer, if you will. The credit card killers, as you guys are. Right. And what about charitable donations, I heard? That happens too? So what we do is we align ourselves with the uh, charitable organization that's familiar with each employment or employer. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is the employees get behind that because they recognize it because it's the charity that they're familiar with. And then they, every, every, every time there's a sale, a portion of that sale goes towards a charity. I love that. Every charitable donation goes toward a payment. That is awesome. Now I hear that Tony Shea and his book, Delivering Happiness, played an instrumental role in what you guys do. Tell them. So basically, I read the book. Tell them. Talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, they all read the book, too, because well, they, they, they had to do it when oh, they started right. working. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, okay. That makes sense. So basically, I read the book, and uh, it, it spoke to me. So I, uh, I basically formed Lamps.com with that you know, culture, happy, happy company, happy customer, happy organization. And uh, you know, we, Keith, when Keith joined, we basically, that, that, that theme just bled throughout the whole company. And we just, it just really is something we grabbed onto. So when we uh, started hitting our revenue goals, we decided to come back to see where it all started. So we're gonna visit Zappos tomorrow. You're visiting Zappos tomorrow? That's exciting. Yeah. yeah, I love to hear that. Well, thank you so much for being our sponsor tonight. Yes.
Hashtag.